So in this last part, we're going to talk about water and why water is so important in biological systems. So if you remember, water is going to be an oxygen with two hydrogens attached to it. And those are polar covalent bonds because the oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogen. So um, what's going to happen is something called hydrogen bonding. And so what that looks like is if we have... our water molecule like this. Remember how it has that partial positive and partial negatives, right? So the hydrogens are partially positive and the oxygens are partially negative. Now what's going to happen is if there's another water molecule nearby and we have our partial positives partial negatives, what's going to happen is these are going to be, whoops, <laughs> these are going to be attracted to one another. So all of a sudden you're going to have this kind of temporary bond form here and that's called a hydrogen bond. And what's going to happen with a hydrogen bond is it's going to make water molecules kind of sticky and that stickiness is going to give them some really important properties. So the reason that's going to work for them is because they're polar. Okay, and that, that's what, why they have a partial positive and partial negative. So what that's going to give water is a bunch of properties. So this first one here is going to be cohesion. And cohesion is just kind of what I drew in that picture, is where you have two water molecules that are attracted to one another. And so that is what makes a belly flop hurt really badly when you do it. And that's because those water molecules are still stuck to one another. And when you slap your stomach on it, that's going to make it um, kind of not break apart as easily as like air would, right? So that's what's responsible for surface tension. So if we look further down here, Here's that hydrogen bond that I was talking about. I mean, that's so not as good as my awesome drawing, but whatever. Um, so you can see that little um, link there between them, right? And that is what's going to give water the properties like this, that surface tension. Um, some even cooler pictures here showing how water kind of forms that bubble, right? And that's due to surface tension as well. Now, another thing that water is going to um, allow is adhesion. And adhesion means that it's going to have an attraction to other substances that it can form a, a hydrogen bond with. So if you look here, this is ammonia. And ammonia is another polar molecule. So you can see the partial negative of that one is being attracted to the partial positive of this one. So anything that it can kind of be attracted to that has that partial charge is going to be able to dissolve in water as well. So here's a really, really important rule you want to remember. If you have a polar substance like water and you mix it with another polar substance, those are going to dissolve no problem. If you have a nonpolar substance and another nonpolar substance, those will dissolve. If you try and mix something that's polar with something that's nonpolar, it will not dissolve. So let's go through some examples. For um, the first one, let's say for polar we've got water and uh, another polar would be ammonia. Those are going to dissolve no problem. If you have polar like water and something that's nonpolar, which would be like an oil, if you put those two together, they're not going to dissolve. And that's because there's no charge on those fats that will allow the water to dissolve into it. Now, if you have something nonpolar and something nonpolar, those will dissolve. So that would be like if you had oil and acetone. Acetone is nail polish remover. If you mix those two together, you can totally get them to dissolve into one another. Okay, and so that's nonpolar and nonpolar because they both don't have a charge. Okay, so another thing that water is able to do is it can actually store heat. And that's because it has those hydrogen bonds. So we've got these sticky water molecules, and let's say we try to heat them up. What's going to happen when we heat things up, as we talked about before, is the molecules want to move faster. So they're going to try and start to move. But if they're sticking together, it's going to take them a while to break apart. And so it's going to be able to store heat that way. That's really important biologically because that's going to allow our body temperature to maintain itself and not fluctuate so much. So that's one of the reasons we're really glad that we're made of mostly water. 
So what we can say about water is that it has a very high specific heat. And we are defining the, um, specific heat, that's the amount of energy required to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So for water, its specific heat is one calorie of energy is required to do that. So going along with that, if it's going to take a lot of energy to get water molecules to even move and heat them up, it's going to take a lot of energy to actually vaporize them and make them actually turn into a gas. And so that's called the high heat of vaporization. Um, next thing is that water is called an effective solvent. And what that means is that things can dissolve very well in it as long as they're polar. Um, so if they're polar, they're going to form a homogeneous mixture, which means you can't see the parts. And that's called a solution. Um, so salt water, Kool-Aid, great examples of that. A heterogeneous mixture, hetero means different, homo means same. Heterogeneous mixture is one where you can see the different parts. The parts separate out. So like oil and water, or like if you have salad dressing, like a vinaigrette. So in a homogeneous mixture or a solution, we have what's called the solvents and the solutes. So the solvent is going to be the predominant substance. So if I use Kool-Aid as an example, the solvent is going to be water. And then the solute is going to be the Kool-Aid crystals because that's what's dissolving into it. Okay. So on an exam, though, if I ask you, like, give, uh, give me a definition for a solvent or a solute, don't be like Kool-Aid. Okay. Give me actual stuff. That's just an example. Okay, so um, one other thing that's neat about the way things dissolve in water is how it forms what's called a hydration shell. And so you can see that here. So we've got salt, sodium chloride, right? And that's that ionic bond that we talked about. And we can dissolve salt in water. And what actually happens is that the... Um, Sodium and the chloride separate from one another, which means they have a charge. Maggie! Oh, I have the worst dogs in the world. Okay, I'm back. Um, so what's going to happen is you've got that positive sodium, that negative chlorine, and what's going to happen is the water molecules are going to form a little shell around them. So what I, what's interesting that I want you to notice about these water molecules is notice the orientation around this one versus this one, okay? And that all has to do with charge. If you think about it, the red in these water molecules is the oxygen, and that is a partial negative charge. So obviously that's going to be attracted to the positive sodium. And then over here, you can see all the white parts are oriented towards the chlorine, and the white parts are going to be the hydrogens, and those have that partial positive charge, which is um, related, uh, attracted to that negative chlorine. So that's what we call a hydration shell when it kind of just goes around it like that. Now, there's obviously going to be a point where the water molecules are going to run out and you're not going to have enough to form a hydration shell. And that's when we say that a solution is saturated. Okay. Now, we've got two terms that are important to know here that are going to come up a lot when we talk about um, membranes. Hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Hydrophilic, um, phile means liking something. Phobia means you're scared or don't like of something. Like, don't like something. So molecules that are attracted to water are going to be hydrophilic, right? So polar molecules are going to be hydrophilic because they like water. Hydrophobic are going to be molecules that are repelled by water. So fats and oils and things that are nonpolar are going to be hydrophobic, okay? So those are going to come up when we talk about other things a lot. All right, and then the last part here is just talking about pH in water. And so what happens with water molecules is they're going to dissociate naturally into H plus and OH minus in a solution. And when we measure the relative concentration of both of those, that's measuring the pH, basically. So your pH can be neutral, acidic, or basic. If it's neutral, it's going to have a pH of 7. And what that means is the amount of OH minus and the amount of H plus are equal. Now, the pH scale goes from 0 to 14, so 7's in the middle, and that's why that's neutral. Um, if you are going to go below 7, then we call it acidic. Acidic, it means that there's a lot more H plus in the solution, and it's going to have a pH value less than 7. Okay? So the lower the pH, the more acidic something is. 
Now bases are going to actually gather up H plus ions so that there's less H plus and more OH minus in a solution. And they're going to have a pH more than 7. So that's going to be um, acids and bases. So if we look at this picture here, this is showing the different um, concentrations of these different things, right? So you can see how battery acid, lemon juice, vinegar, those types of things are going to be pretty acidic. And if we look at the solution, there's a bunch of H pluses floating around. Whereas if we look at neutral, like pure water, human blood, um, a lot of biological um, fluids, you can see that those are neutral because OH minus and the H plus are equal to one another. And then in this last part, you can see a basic solution. That's going to be where you have a whole bunch of OH minuses, but just a few H pluses, right? And so that's going to be the difference between um, acids and bases. All righty. Now, one thing that we haven't talked about yet are buffers. Buffers, their job is to keep the pH the same, no matter what it is you're talking about. And what's going to happen is, let's say you have something with a pH of 12 that's really basic, and you start adding acid to it. If you add acid to that solution, the pH should start going down, right? It should go from 12 to 11 to 10 or whatever. What's going to happen is if you have a buffer, the buffer is going to gather up those acidic molecules, those H pluses, and keep the pH at 12. So you would know you had a buffer in a solution if you were adding an acid or a base and the pH doesn't change. It doesn't care about going to 7. I don't know why people always think buffers have to bring stuff back to 7. doesn't matter. It doesn't care about the number 7. It's all about trying to actually get that pH to stay the same. And then the last part about water here is that water tends to have a lower density as a solid than it does as a liquid. So that's why ice floats, right? It's less dense. And the reason for that is because it's going to form this crystalline structure that you can see here. So on the right, you've got liquid water, and it's got those weak hydrogen bonds. But when water actually solidifies in the ice, what happens is those hydrogen bonds become permanent, and they push out when they do that. And so little bubbles of air are going to fill in that area between those water molecules, and that's what makes it um, less dense. The other thing that it makes it do is expand, right? And that's why we have to be very careful about keeping our cells not too cold because if they freeze, the water in them is going to expand and that could cause our cells to burst. So that's why that's a really important topic about that. So that is basically water and pH and chemistry in a nutshell. So if you have any questions, make sure that you ask me next time you see me.